chapter 4. Amen. And I'm so glad to see you. I love you, folks. I love you. I appreciate you. It's a good church. It's good people. We got a good thing going on here. You know that? Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Verse 12. 1 Peter 4 and 12. And uh, I, have, I have the scriptures up here today. I didn't have time to do the the PowerPoint that I do. So I do have the scriptures. That'll be in the King James on the screen for now. I do have this in a different version at times I'll be, but it'll be up there on the screen for you, okay? Verse 12, chapter 4, 1 Peter. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers, listen to this, partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Do you know there's joy in the Lord, joy being saved, even through trials. I know it's hard. I'm going to try to minister. This will be just part one of this message I'm working on. I've got a couple messages I'm working on. I'm working on another one. I've got, a, I've got some things going. I, I've been waking up lately at 4.30 in the morning. This morning I woke up at 5.30. I've been waking up early in the morning, and I, I got things going on in my mind. I'm thinking, and the Lord is speaking to my heart. But today I want to minister on the subject, seasons of being tested. Seasons of being tested and I, I, I don't know. There are times when you go through trials, normal trials, just trials, get a flat tire, right? Uh, uh, Mimi, you get a flat tire, just crazy. And it happens on a Sunday. Uh, the washer goes out, the refrigerator goes out, whatever it might be. You got different daily trials. But then there are times when you know that you're being tested. And I, I feel that right now that's exactly what I'm going through. My wife and I, we just feel that we're being tested. And... Um, I, I believe at times you feel that the devil is just coming after you, you know. And I, I knew this. Don't, don't get me wrong. I knew this that would happen. Uh, once we got closer to the building, uh, getting it started, getting it going, we're getting the money now. Things are looking very good. I knew the devil would attack. I knew it. And he always attacks me in my, in my health. Uh, please pray for me in that aspect, okay? But today I, I want to minister on this subject, seasons of being tested. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you in the name of the Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. I'm asking for your help, your anointing, your unction as we preach this word. Father God, that you would speak from, Lord, heaven above. I pray that it would open. I pray, Lord, that you would just help us today. I know that you have a word that will touch our hearts. I'm nothing without you. I need your Holy Spirit. I need your power. I need your wisdom. Lord, I pray today, God, that you would penetrate trade and touch our hearts and change us. Encourage us in your word, I pray. Strengthen the body of Christ. I'm asking this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. And you may be seated here today. Again, this morning, I pray this word will be a blessing to you. I'm going to be ministering seasons of being tested. And rest assured that if you're trying to walk righteously before the Lord, that you're being tested. There's no doubt about that. If you're not being tested at the moment, just hold on because it will come. I promise you that. I do believe that our faith will be tested, especially in these last days these times that we're living in, all the things that we're facing and that we can talk about even in political arena, our nation, the direction it's going, the evilness, the wickedness, the darkness, we can also in this time will be tested. There's a separation, I believe, taking place right now between the sheep and the goats, and we're going to find out those which are serious about God and which ones are not. The Bible even talks about a day of apostasy when people's hearts will grow cold towards the end of times. I believe we're there. I believe that we are on the brink of the rapture of the church. I believe that Jesus can come at any moment, but until he comes, we've got to labor, we've got to work, we've got to uh, preach the gospel of Christ and try to win the lost and, and just encourage others in the faith as well. Uh, but we've got to continue to work and to serve the Lord until he does come. But I do believe that there is a time of apostasy when our hearts are beginning to grow cold and then different towards God and people are falling away from the Lord and going another direction. I believe that since COVID hit in year 2000 that we have a little bit of understanding about the testing of our faith. That, uh, uh, 2020 20, uh, 2020, that is. The devil doesn't want you believing God. He doesn't want you serving God. He doesn't want you to be a part of corporate worship. He doesn't want you to be in church. He doesn't want you here. He doesn't want you worshiping the Lord, my friend. He doesn't want your life to have an impact on others. And the last thing the devil wants is for our light to shine in a darkened world. But if you've ever had an opportunity to let your light shine, it is right now, my beloved. The darker this world becomes, the greater our light can shine. The darker it is, and people are searching 
direction and people are looking and people maybe have questions and you can answer, be prepared to be able to share the gospel with them or to answer those questions or to pray with them. I, I was at the YMCA there the other day. I believe it was uh, Friday night, I think it was. I try to go two or three times out of the week for my health and just my physical body, just trying to keep it in shape and keep going. And uh, there's, a, there's a man there that I talk to from time to time. He's, he's younger than me. Maybe he's in his late 30s or early 40s or somewhere in that uh, area. And uh, he, he's talked to me before about uh, about the uh, the times that we're living in and what's going on and and uh, all these different situations in the, in America. And he just doesn't understand. And he's a little bit afraid. He's a little bit fearful. Well, I saw him this Friday night again. And we got to talking. And I asked him how he was doing and how things were going. And he says, I just don't know. I just don't know. He says, you know, Pastor, he says, uh, you might see me in your church yet. And I said, you know what? I said, we'd be glad to have you. You got to be ready, my friend. Let your light shine. Let them see that there's something different inside of you. Let me say this. The deeper your walk with God, the more intense that your testing will be. The scripture makes this very clear. Look at Daniel 11 and 32, and I'm just going to read some of the scriptures here in these verses. The people who know their God shall be strong. Anybody know their God? They shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Now, when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end because it is still for the appointed time. And so the scripture tells us that a time is coming upon those of understanding, people like you and I. Uh, just who are these people who will be tested? Well, the people that will be tested or refined are the righteous. They're the ones that are saved. They're the born again, those that belong to God, those that do great exploits for the Lord, those who walk with God and have the wisdom of Christ. Right now, you might be in the middle of a test. You love the Lord. You're doing your best to walk in obedience to God. You want to draw closer in your relationship with the Lord. You don't have any known sin in your life. You're trying to live right and live a life that's pleasing unto God. And you wonder why you are going through the test. You wonder why. Why the test? Uh, Lord, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? Why the struggle? Why the hardship? Why the physical illnesses that I am facing? Why am I going through this? Uh, well, remember back in your school days, for me, it's been a long time since I graduated from high school. But when a test in school was given, it revealed how much you actually had learned of what you had been taught. Remember that? That's why they give you a test. They want to see if you've learned what you have been taught. And yet Paul spoke of a different kind of school. It's called the school of Christ. It's a lifelong school. It's not just through kindergarten through the 12th grade, but this is a lifelong school that will continue to be learning as God teaches us. This school started the moment you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Savior, and God put you on a new journey of faith, and in this school, we are going to learn about ourselves, and we're going to learn about Jesus, and we're going to learn about the Word of God, and we're going to learn about about the will of God for our lives. And it's not always easy. It's not always a, a walk in the park. It's not a bowl of cherries at all times. There are tests and there are trials and there are fiery trials and there is persecution and there is the spiritual warfare that we endure as a child of God. If you belong to God, you are in his school and you might have thought that you graduated by now, but we won't fully graduate until we're with him and glory. Hallelujah. And the Holy Ghost is the teacher and he is leading and guiding and speaking and showing and illuminating and revealing things to us about God. But we, my friend, will be in this school until the Lord comes and that day will come when we'll hear the trumpet of God and the voice of an archangel and we shall be caught up together in the air and the Bible says that we'll be changed in a twinkling of an eye and this corruption will put on incorruptible and this mortal body will put on immortality and we'll be given a glorified body but until then we'll be tested and will always be learning as the spirit of God teaches us hallelujah Bible said that he will lead us into all truth you know when I was in school I, I didn't like taking tests anybody here when you were in high school did you like taking tests did you love it when you had test day uh, you know when those kids are on the school bus always ask them on a Thursday or a Friday do you got a test today and someone that's oh yes we got a, a test in history and they said I can't stand history and I said you know what when I was your age I didn't like history either but when you get older you'll appreciate history so go ahead and try to learn all that you can and when those kids get off the bus 
I said, all right, kids, got to get them brain cells working. Got to use them today. Got to learn something. All right, praise the Lord. But I didn't like it when it was test day. I did not like that. I, I didn't like studying for the test. I despised it, my friend. I couldn't stand it when I had a test, and I would be nervous on test day, and my stomach would be in knots, especially if I didn't study for it like I should have. And I'm going to ask you now, how many procrastinators do we have in the house of God today that you studied for the test at the last minute? Come on now. You studied on the way to school. You studied on the school bus on the way to school. Or you studied at the last minute, and that was me. I would always study at the last minute, you know, and I didn't like it. I just didn't care for studying exams and tests and things like this, and, and I couldn't wait till school was over, and I thought I don't have to study anymore, and I don't have to crack open a book anymore, but then I went to college, and then I had to study through college, and I graduated college, and then I got a job working at Ingle Shipyard in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi, and they put me through two more years of night school, of engineering classes there, and so I had two more years of that, and then I got saved later in life. I was 27 years old. I got saved, and God changed everything. Everything. My whole career and everything changed it all uh, and uh, said that you're going to be a, in the ministry and you're going to be a pastor. Well, here I am. Now, you know what? And I had to go for the four and a, four and a half more years of Bible college, uh, studying and learning and testing and all these kind of things. And then now as a pastor, you got to study at all the time, day and night, because you've you got Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and men's Bible study. So you're constantly cracking open the book, the Bible, and you're reading and you're studying and you are prepared my friend, but I didn't especially like it, especially if I wasn't prepared to take a test. I also didn't like taking pop quizzes. Oh my goodness, I couldn't stand those. You know, the unannounced test, and yet the Lord has told us to be ready to be tested at any time. God might give you a pop quiz today. God might give you a pop quiz tonight or tomorrow. You never know. You got to be ready at all times, and, and, and that these tests will continue until Jesus returns. All those who love the the Lord are going to go through the fiery trials and be purged of all that which is not of God. You're going to be tested. You're going to be purged and God is going to get all the dross out of you and he's going to get all the impurities out of you and he's going to get rid of all of the flesh and all of the carnality and all of the carnal thinking out of your lives and out of your hearts and he's going to change us and that is the will of God. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 7. It says, Behold, I will refine them and try them. Jeremiah 9 and 7. I don't know why it's not coming up. Is it up on the monitor there, folks? Okay, something not working there. Behold, I will refine them and try them. Now the word refine means to reduce to a pure state. Now that's what God's trying to do in your life. Why the troubles, Lord? Why the hardships? Why the difficulties? Because God is trying to reduce us, sanctify us to a pure state. It means to become free of impurities, free of sediments, free of foreign matters or objects. In Zechariah 13 and 9 it says, I will bring one third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them, notice this, as gold is tested, they will call on my name, I will answer them, I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. Can you say that? That today the Lord is my God. To refine gold, they have to put it in the fire. Because when you find gold in its raw sense, out of the rocks or the mountains or the caves or, or whatever, the mines, it's it's got a lot of other minerals that are mixed in with it, a lot of other impurities that are mixed in with it, and even gold that looks like gold, but it's false gold, but it shines like gold, but it's not the real thing. And the only thing you can do to separate the impurities or the fake gold from the real gold is you gotta put it in a fire. And you got to turn it up and you let that gold simmer and you let it cook and you let it come to almost a boil. And then what happens is the uh, impurities, uh, the sediments, the dross, uh, uh, the things uh, that are not the true gold will come to the surface and they'll take a net and they'll scoop that out and they'll, they'll purify it over and over and over. And the hotter the fire, the greater the separation of the sediments and the dross and the impurities. And sometimes that's what God does with us. God does it with the gold. Uh, that you do it with the gold, you do it with the silver, but God does it with us. See, God isn't 
testing the lost. The lost will not be going through the testing of their faith. God isn't purging those who do not belong to him. The lost will be judged. The lost will receive the wrath of God. The lost will be punished. The wicked will die in their sins and be cast into hell and to outer darkness. But those that belong to God, the Bible says that we will be refined and tested. In fact, one of the evidences that you are a child of God is the testing of your faith because God cares more about your character than he does your comfort. God cares about you. He cares about your character. Who cares about who you are and what you become, my friend? Hallelujah. It's the will of God that each of us be refined into the image of his son. In fact, Romans 8 and 29, for whom he foreknew, that means in the knowledge of God, the foreknowledge of God, because God is not separate by time. He knows all things all at once at all times. He also predestined, that means to be the will of God, to be conformed or changed to the image of his son. He wants to bring us to Christ likeness in our conduct, in our attitude, the way that we treat one another. Hallelujah. Husband, the way you treat your wife. Wife, the way you treat your husband husband. Kids, uh, how you act, your character. God wants to bring us to a place of Christ likeness like his son. You might be one of the most faithful Christians on the face of the earth, but your faith is still going to be tested and God wants to bring you to the place to where you no longer see you, but now we see Christ in you. Glory to God. So that when you look in the mirror, you no longer see yourself, but now you see the image of Jesus. Hallelujah. You see the image of Jesus. Hallelujah. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Amen. Sometimes I look in the mirror and I say, Mark, I'm so tired of you. Huh? Come on. You ever, man, I'm so tired of this flesh. I'm so tired. And, and, and you know, sometimes we, we fail and we make mistakes and we make boo-boos. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? We, we blunders and mess up and things like that. And sometimes I just say, oh, God, if you can do anything with this, do something with it. Hallelujah. Make it more like you. Make it more like Jesus in my conduct and my reactions and my attitudes and how I talk to you and how I treat you and how you talk to me and how you treat me and how you talk to other people and how you treat them because if you're talking like the world if you're drinking like the world if you're acting like the world if you got a hot temper like the world if you're doing just like the world and dressing like the world and becoming just like the world then you're no different in the world you have nothing nothing to offer them it's not our sameness that's going to attract the world it is our distinctiveness if the church what happened to the church getting back to holiness, getting back to separation? But I find that the church wants to be just like the world and still have the assurance that they're going to go to heaven. Bible said that you love the world, you're an enemy of God. God didn't deliver us out of Egypt to become like Egypt. He didn't deliver us out of the world to become like the world. He delivered us out of the world that we might become more like him. Hallelujah. That's the will of God. What happened to separation in the church? Or even faithfulness. I mean, think about this. Just think about this. I want God to get everything out of me that's not of him. And I want him to pour more of himself into me. Israel was delivered in a day out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. David ran from Saul for 20 years before he was king. Think about that. Anointed by Samuel, the prophet of God, by Hannah, the son of Hannah, Samuel. And there, anointed and called of God, chosen by God. But yet he would have to fight to be able to be king over Israel. And even after Saul and Jonathan died with the battle with the Philistines, we find that David still had to wait two more years before before he became king of all of Israel. But yet it was the will of God and the call of God, the anointing of God for David to be king. But in all of that, I know that God was sanctifying David, that David would not touch Saul unless it was the will of God, even when he had the opportunity. In other words, he's bringing David to a place that he won't budge, he won't move, unless it's the will of God. That's what he's doing. And... It took Moses being 40 years on the backside of the desert in a hot and dry, lonely place. It took Paul being three years in the Arabian desert. It took Joseph being falsely accused and rejected and placed in prison. But in every test and every trial and difficulty and hardship and adversity, God is working in you and through you to prepare you for his purpose. And that's why Peter said to rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's suffering. Because when you come to this place, there is something of the glory of God that comes upon you. 
let people see that there's something different hallelujah in fact what happens is you even are different than regular church people hallelujah there's something different something of God something of the glory of God something of the touch of God something of heaven something supernatural something spiritual that takes place in your life when you come to the place where you're empty of yourself and more of Christ in you and through you that when you look in the mirror you don't see yourself but you see Jesus hallelujah James said to count it joy when you fall into various trials, James 1 and 2. Now, God, you can, we'll get into that later, but, but God is even perfecting and maturing us in that. Why? Because God is producing something in you that has worth and value. Well, what is it that has worth and value that God is looking for? It's your faith. Can you say faith? Listen, church, it's your faith. I know, you know, we know whether we have faith. Amen? Praise God. We know whether we have faith, and we can know even if we have faith in our faithfulness. Your faith is much more precious than gold that perishes. God looks at faith differently differently than we do. Our faith is important to God. Faith is the key that unlocks all the spiritual blessings we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. Hallelujah. Faith is the key, my friend. If you want the blessings of God, you want, you want God to touch, you want God to answer. Faith is the key. We always come to God by faith. When Peter was being sifted by the devil, Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith not fail. And many times we're praying to get out of the trial. God, get me out of the mess. Get me out of this situation. Oh God, this is hard. And there's nothing wrong with crying out to God. There's nothing wrong with praying. But it could be that God is praying that our faith not fail while we go through the trial. Maybe God wants to bring you through it instead of around it. Maybe, maybe, well, pray, pray, God, get me out of this, get me out of this. No, 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 I want to bring you through this, not around this. There's no other way for the sanctifying process to take place except to go through the trial. We have to go through the fire, but when the three Hebrew men were in the fire, they were not alone. Notice this, that Jesus showed up, that's right, in the middle of the furnace, in the middle of the fire, in the middle of the heat, in the middle of the trial, God shows up. You know what that means? It means this, that in the middle of all this, you're not alone. It means that God sees, it means that God knows your situation, that that means that God will give you the strength that's needed to get you through it. Hallelujah. God is there. Praise the Lord. Listen, David often spoke of being tested and tried. He said in 1 Chronicles 29 and 17, I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. Prayer, David, in Psalm 17 and 3, you have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. Listen to this. You have tried me and found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. God, I'm not going to murmur. I'm not going to complain. My mouth will not transgress. I am going to trust the Lord. Now, saints of God, I couldn't begin to tell you all the ways the Lord tests his children, but there are a few tests that are common to all of us that I want to try to focus on this morning. I won't get through all of this, but I'm going to deal with one of them here today. Number one is this, that we're tested by afflictions and sufferings. We are tested by afflictions and sufferings. Job 5 and 7, yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. If you ever seen a campfire and you see the hundreds or thousands of sparks that fly upward, that's the troubles of man. If you can get a picture of that, that he endures in a lifetime. We could write a book just on this topic and there are many scriptures in the word of God that support this subject. But one of the most important and difficult things for Christians to deal with is the suffering of the righteous. For some reason, we think that if we're saved, that we're not going to have any more problems. If we're saved, we're not going to have any more troubles. Well, up to the time of Christ, the Jews associated prosperity and good health with godliness. And they believed that if you were wealthy or you were healthy or you were blessed, that God was with you. And this is why Jesus' disciples had a hard time understanding this statement when Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God because they look at a rich man and they think all oh, God is with him and the Lord has blessed him and God has favored him. The same thing with the rich young ruler. I mean, people would look at the rich young ruler and think that he's so successful and he's done so well in his life and they thought that God was with him and God had blessed him, my friend. But no, he had all the riches, but he did not have the Lord and he did not give them up for the Lord. Has anybody ever watched the movie 
Fiddler on the Roof. I think it was made in the 70s. How many know the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Oh, man, that's, yeah, that's a movie that you ought to watch. You'll understand the concept if you have seen this movie. But he begins to sing. Uh, he's a Jew, and he begins to sing, If I were a rich man, la da 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 Remember that? Da, 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 da. You know, if I were a rich man. In other words, I want the blessing of God. If I were a rich man, amen. The Jews equate riches or material wealth as God's blessings and God's favor. And there's no doubt that God provides. And there's no doubt that God blesses. But just because you don't have money or because you don't have riches or because you don't have fame doesn't mean that you don't have the blessings and the favor of God upon your life. Listen, we've listened too long to the lies of the prosperity preachers today that says, if you're in the will of God, you won't have any problems. But that's a bold-faced lie. That's not true. Let me tell you, if you're in the will of God, you will have problems. If you're in the will of God, you'll be tested. You'll have trials. The devil will come after you. The devil is prowling around right now seeking someone to devour. Oh, yes. I remember years ago when I was doing the Truth and Fact devotionals, and you can get those on our website, of course, but we were on 10 different radio stations. I don't know. We were in South Carolina. We were in Michigan. We were in Ohio. We had three stations in Ohio. I, we had different states. We had 10. At one time, we were paying $450 a month for 10 radio stations for the Truth and Fact would go out there every day. It was incredible. And, uh, and so this man was listening to one of my truth and facts and devotionals. I don't know which one it was, but it's somewhere along the lines of this message about Christians going through trials and difficulties and hardships. And the Lord is with them and sanctifying them and purifying them and things like this. And uh, he got mad. I think he was riding on 71 going into Michigan or something like that. And he got mad. He got so mad that he wrote an email to the radio station. And the radio station forwarded the email to me. And the man said, I had no idea what I was talking about. That's what he did. He's outraged. He said, what you're, what you're teaching is false. You have no idea what you're saying. He said, in fact, you're not even saved. That's what he told me. That's what he told me. Wait a minute. I'm not saved because I said that you're going to go through trials and hardships and difficulties. If I, listen, that's what the Bible says. That's what the word of God says. But God said that he would be with you. But God has a purpose in everything that you're going through. Peter was in the will of God. Even though he was being sifted by the devil, Jesus had prayed for him. Jesus was in the will of God as he was led by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness. And you might be tested right now. And it could be the will of God for your life. I don't know how I got this far without my handkerchief, but we're getting there, okay? Now, there are a lot of righteous people that love God that have very little material possessions, but they have the blessings of God. They do. I'm one of them. I don't have much. I don't, in material possessions, I don't have much. In fact, I'm probably worth more dead than I'm alive because I've got an insurance policy. Don't tell my wife, okay? But you know what I'm talking about. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't have much as far as, as the world is concerned. And, and the world will look at me as a nothing and a nobody. And I, I, I'll even have uh, people that maybe even my family that will look at me as a nothing and a nobody because I don't have great big investments. In fact, the only investment I had uh, is cut by 60% now. Thank you, Joe Biden, for cutting that in half. He's messing up my retirement, whatever. But you know what? And I got worried about that. And I struggled over that. And I kind of fretted over that. And I was doing really well. And things were going good for the future of my retirement, things like this. But you know what? I had to put that in the hands of God. I don't have control over that. I don't have control of what's going on in the world right now. I'm not connected to this place. I'm connected to another place. I'm connected to God. And I have to remember that my riches are being stored up in heaven. That when I depart from this place, I'm not taking anything with me, but my soul will go to heaven and to be in the presence of Almighty God. And I have to keep my focus on God, on the glory of the Lord and the riches that we have through Christ Jesus. The spiritual riches, not the material riches that can be stolen or a thief can take, but the riches of God that we have through Jesus. I, I, I got a, my car out here. It's a 2014. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I tried my best to keep care of that because it's paid for and I don't want to pay for another car. I'm tired of car notes. And so I, I make sure in the wintertime I go through the car wash every time it snows or rains because of the salt and things like this. And I try to take care of it. And, I, and, I, and the other day I had some brake issues and brake problems. 
and like Brother Tim were talking about, they're all hanging up, and I had some problems with this, and, and my rotors were going bad or whatever, the bearings, I had to take it into the shop, it was 900 bucks, just like that, they had it for a couple days, it was 900 bucks, and they said, because of the erosion, because of the salt, and I said, I don't understand, I try to take care of this vehicle, well, what that just tells me is that no matter how long you try to take care of things, eventually, they're going to road away, they're not going to last forever, in fact, the Bible talks about that everything that you see is fading away, Everything and somewhat is deteriorating. That's why they always want somebody to live in an empty house because an empty house will deteriorate. You do nothing to the house, it'll deteriorate over time. All this is deteriorating. The earth is busted up like a broken egg right now. But one day our redemption draws nigh, hallelujah, and we'll be in the presence of God. We're not taking anything with us, our money, our retirement, our cars, our houses, our jewelry, our boats, our car, our guns, our motorcycles, or whatever you might have, or hobby that you have. You're not taking it with you, but the only thing that goal will be your soul and the Bible said to be absent to the body is to be present with the Lord and in other words I've got to keep my focus on heaven I've got to keep my focus on the Lord I'm not trying to gain the best and the riches of the world I want the riches of Jesus my heart yearns for the riches of Christ my heart yearns for God hallelujah do you know what I'm talking about I have a heart that yearns for the Lord and hungers for more of Jesus No, no, don't get me wrong. I know we have to have money to buy things. I realize that. I'm just saying that that's not my life. I'm not living for that. And so, and so if you want to judge me, judge me based on being a child of God, not on whether I have a lot in this earth or not. Whether I have an expensive house or not or an expensive car or not, that doesn't matter. What matters is that I'm saved, sanctified, set apart, living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. How praise God that uh, we know that we're saved and I know that I am. Amen. Praise the Lord. There are a lot of righteous people that do love the Lord that have very little possessions, uh, but they have the blessings of God. Look at the widow that gave two mites. Uh, two mites isn't much. Uh, I've got two pennies right here. It's even less than that. Uh, in the New Testament, in the Bible, two mites. Uh, some can't even give that to God uh, but she gave all that she had if you'll read there and understand and look at that she gave out of her poverty Jesus said uh, but notice that Jesus saw it uh, Jesus took notice uh, the rich gave out of their abundance uh, what does that mean uh, it really wasn't much of a sacrifice to them uh, but this woman gave all that she had uh, oh my beloved are we going to say that God wasn't with her no my friend uh, Jesus took notice uh, and this poor widow woman she loved God for she gave out of her poverty she gave until it hurt I don't hope I'm, hope I'm not boring you folks today I got I got I got to hurry I got I I told my wife I said I'm preaching a short message today I said I I cut it back by five pages She looked at me and shook her head. She said, yeah, right. Brother Tom, encourage me. Help me, brother. <laughs> Amen. Sister Faith, love you, Sister Faith. You are precious. My goodness, you are precious. Everybody's precious. Every one of you are precious. You just are. I love you. I love you. Uh, I love you, Brother Tim. Thank you. I just, uh, but you know, um, we can see the heroes of faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews. And they all walked with God. Listen, they all had faith, but they, they suffered stonings and tortures and mockings and torments and violent deaths. And some suffered trials of cruel mockings and scourgings and whippings. And Paul walked closely with God. Paul called of God, anointed of God, a chosen vessel of the Lord that saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And yet he was shipwrecked and stoned and flogged and whipped and lost, left for dead. He was robbed and falsely accused, put in prison, persecuted and suffered for the loss of all things. Why? These were all testings and purgings. And the proving of his faith. Listen, Peter said this. Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and 6, in this greatly rejoice, though now for a little while or for a season, for a season if need be, you have been grieved by various trials or different kinds of trials that the genuineness of your faith or the real faith or the real thing being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You'll be found, I pray, faithful to the end, my friend. Don't quit and don't give up. One of the most dangerous things 
things a parent can do is to offer sympathy and comfort to a child who's under discipline before that child learns the lesson. You may or may not agree with me in parenting and all this kind of thing, but to coddle a child before they've learned their lesson can undo everything that they're trying to teach them. This can destroy the child. Listen, my beloved friends, in love I say, if the rod is spared and the lesson is never learned, then rebellion will eventually set in. Not only rebellion against their parents, but ultimately rebellion against God. God chastens those who belong to him, and he chastens those he loves. Listen, God won't move until we've learned what he is trying to teach us. In other words, what I'm saying is he will not lift the rod until you yield. God isn't going to yield to you. You yield to God. God doesn't surrender to you. You surrender to God. I've seen too many episodes where the child was grounded, but they sweet talk their mama or their dad. Usually it's the mama uh out of the punishment. And when that happens, instead of the child yielding to the parent, the parent yields to the child. And I see this happen all the time today. The children run the home, not the parents. You know exactly what I'm talking about. This is more harmful and destructive than you realize, and it actually is destroying their soul. You see, the whole time that you're being tested and disciplined by God, you are under God's protection. The Bible tells us that those who are tested by many trials and temptations are kept by the power of God through faith. You can call out to God thinking that you're in danger, but he, but he knows that you're not. He's only waiting for you to learn the lesson, and usually the lesson is he wants us to trust him. He wants us to believe him by faith and obedience unto God. Remember when Peter walked on water? Do y'all remember that? When he said, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come. So Peter was the only disciple, and he got on the boat, and he's walking on water to get to Jesus. The eye of Peter's faith was on Jesus, not on the storm. And as soon as Peter began to look at the wind and the waves, what happened? He began to sink. But even in the trial, I want you to get this. Even in the trial of his faith, Jesus was right there the whole time. It may have seemed that Peter was in danger, but listen, the presence of God was there. Even in the storm, with the waves, with the wind, with the turmoil, with all the conditions and all that was going on, the presence of God was right there with Peter. And as soon as Peter cried out to Jesus, Jesus saved him. And the Lord caught Peter by the hand and led him back into the boat. But I want you to get this. Peter was safe before he got back into the boat. He was safe in the middle of the storm. He was safe in the boisterous waters. Jesus was right there with him and regardless of what you're going through as long as Jesus is there with you you're safe whether it be through the storm or the trial or the difficulty as long as Jesus is there you're going to be okay all I want is the Lord if I have God with me I'm all right. that's why Paul and Silas were able to endure what they went through when they went into jail and the bats were beaten and bleeding That's why that others were able to go through such difficulties because they knew that God was with them. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. God, Christians would be persecuted in the past and put in prison and stockades. And they said, only if you'll recant, we'll let you go. And they would say, how can I recant for wherever I am, Jesus is there with me. They looked at this differently than we do today. We look at this as God is against us or God doesn't love me. But back then they said whatever torment, whatever trial, whatever difficulty, whatever persecution, I'm not going to recant. I'm not going to refute that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior because of whether I'm in the dungeon, whether I'm in the jail, whether I'm stockades, whatever kind of persecution, whatever prison you put me in, God is there with me now. Hallelujah. The presence of God would carry them and hold them together. God allows suffering and trials in their lives. He's after one thing. It's the same thing he was after when he asked Abraham to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac. And God allowed Abraham to lead Isaac up the mountain to raise the knife above him. And it was only then that the Lord said, do not lay your hand on him. In Genesis 22 and 12, what was it that the Lord was after? Simply this, Abraham, do I mean more to you than your deepest earthly affections? Abraham, do you love me more than anything else on this earth? Now catch, listen, don't let 
let me lose you here. Don't let me lose you here. Do you love God more than anything else on this earth? Abraham, listen, was willing to lay down all that was near and dear to him, his only son, the very object of God's promise to him. He had waited for 25 years for the son of promise. He waited and waited until a miracle took place. But now he's at the place in his life that he's willing to lay down even the object of God's promise to him. I'm willing to give it up. I'm willing to lay it down. I don't know how it's all going to work. I don't understand. But I do know this, that God gave me a promise. And if God has to raise my son from the dead, I believe he'll do it. Very few of us are at this place. Abraham was willing to put his future in God's hands. Now, and, and I, got, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want you to get this. He, Abraham was willing to put his future. That's my son. That's the son of promise, God, the covenant that you said that the, my descendants would be as numerous as the stars. And it's the sand of the sea. And now you're telling me to give it up. That's a critical, crucial point in our life, a life of decision. Will I give it all up to God? Will I give my future to God? Will I give my life? Will I give it up to the Lord? Abraham did. Abraham he gave it all to the Lord, everything. He held nothing back. Now, I want you to see what happens here. I want you to get this. Abraham poured himself out to God in the same way that God poured himself out to us. It's a picture in the Old Testament, and that was by giving his only son to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins and forgiveness, the Lord Jesus Christ. When God gave us his son, he gave us his all. He gave us his best. He poured all of heaven out for you and I, everything. Let me ask you the question, why is it that we hold back? Why is it that we hold back? We hold back in our faith. We hold back in our commitment. We hold back in our faithfulness. We hold back when it comes to sacrifice. We hold back when it comes to giving and supporting. Oh, we'll spend it on what we want. Some of us are in such a financial condition in our lives, it's a mess that you can't even tithe. But if you'd start tithing and give it to God, you'll see what happens. The Lord will help you. I'm not saying it'll be gone like that, but you, he'll help you. I'm telling you, my friend. I've seen, I've, I've seen people that would be in a huge financial mess and they go out and they buy more and they buy more and they buy more and they're already in a mess. We hold back when it comes to giving and supporting. We hold back, we hold our hearts back from complete surrender. But let's be honest, we all do, don't we? Let's be honest, this is the struggle, isn't it? I, do you think this has something to do with when Jesus said that we have to pick up our cross daily? Crucify ourselves, pick up your cross daily, and follow him. It, that, is, that means that every day I'm living for God. Every day. It's not just, it's, it's every day I've made this conscious decision. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to pick up my cross. I'm going to carry it. I'm going to follow God. Abraham held nothing back. I want you to see the results of Abraham's obedience. Genesis 22, 15 through 18. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, because you've obeyed, because of this act that you've done, and not withheld your son, your only son. He said, blessing will I bless you, and multiply, and I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sands of which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In other words, he's saying, is that Abraham, I'm going to give you the victory. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That's you and I, because you've obeyed my voice, because the obedience of Abraham. By Abraham giving up what he had to God. He had more, not less. God blessed him. God helped him. God prospered him, strengthened him. God led him. God was a friend to Abraham. And this is what God is looking for in you and I, my friend. 
The testing of your faith is to remove all self out so that God can move in. The testing of our faith is so that he can rule and reign in our lives. The testing of our faith is so that there might be more of him and less of us. The testing of our faith is to reveal what's inside of me that needs to come out and which is in him can come in. The testing of our faith is to purge out the impurities of my life that are holding me back from experiencing more of God in my life. See, some of us, you feel like God is distant. You feel like your walk with God is shallow. He seems so far away. It seems that you don't have answered prayer. It seems that you're not receiving the blessings of God lately. And that's because we are the ones that are holding back. We, in other words, we are hurting ourselves. Holding back is only hurting us, my friend. No, my friend. The testing of our faith is imperative. The more we pour out to our, ourselves to God, the richer we become spiritually. Abraham was blessed even more after he obeyed God. Abraham was blessed even after he gave his most deepest earthly affections to God. Abraham loved Isaac with all his heart, but Abraham loved God more. He loved him more. More. And when you get to this place in your life, you're getting somewhere with God. Now, 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 oh, hallelujah. Joseph had falsely accused by his family, but abandoned by his brothers, put in prison. But all that time, God was preparing him to be second in command of Egypt. When, you, when we get to the end of ourselves, when we get to the bottom of it, when it all belongs to God, it's all the Lord. When you pour yourself out to God and give it all up to him, you will experience the blessings of his presence and his power and mercy and grace upon your life. You will encounter the Lord in greater capacities than you ever imagined in your life. The Lord will reveal himself to you and you'll experience the moving of God in your life. Maybe that's why we're experiencing seasons of testings right now. Maybe that's why. Why the test? Why the trial? Why the health issues? Why the financial struggles? Why is it so hard? It's not because God is angry or mad at you. No, no. It's because he wants you to experience his power and blessing. He wants you to know him in a greater capacity. He wants, you to he wants to remove you out of the way so that he can fill you with himself. And so that when people see you, they don't see some dead religious person. They don't see a religious person. They see a living Savior upon your countenance. They see something in you and through you. And they see something glowing from you. They see something of God, something of heaven, something of the Lord. Because you've been tried. You've been through the fire. And you didn't give up. And you didn't quit. But God was faithful. And God was with you. And his presence was with you. And he brought you through it. And you learned from those things. And you go through it again. You'll say, God was with me before. God will be with me again. The victories of my past give me confidence for the victories of my present. Hallelujah. What do you mean by that? I got, I got to quit. What do you mean? I told my wife it's a short message, right? When David went after Goliath, and notice this, David went after Goliath. He's a type of what the church should be. David went after Goliath. He didn't have the armor because that had been tried. But what he knew was that slingshot that he had. He knew how to use that. That's really a type of the word of God, if you will. But notice that David went after the giant and he put the stone and he began to sling it. David had something that others did not have. Saul did not have it. All of Israel did not have it. David had confidence in God. David had conviction in the Lord. David knew that God was with him. David had faith in God. And David said, the Lord was with me. Amen. Amen. When he killed the Paul, the bear, the Paul, the lion, the Lord was with me and the Lord is with me right now. The Lord was with me before the victories of my past. Give me confidence for the victories of my present. God was with me before. God will be with me now. And he took that stone and put it in there and slung it at Goliath and it hit him right between the eyes and knocked him dead. Hallelujah. And then he cut off his head with his, with his own sword. My friend, the victory, the confidence that comes as knowing God, knowing the Lord, standing upon the word of God, God will bring you through. God will bring you through. God will bring you through. 
God is preparing the church. And the only way to prepare the church is to go through the fire. Things that are coming ahead, you got to hold on. You can't give up. You got to endure to the end. Some are suffering. Some wonder why. God is with you, and God is working in you, and God is helping you. And sometimes, even at your weakest moments of life, is when His glory is revealed the most. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? When I come to the end of myself, his glory is revealed the most. And that's what God wants to see. He wants to see little Jesus is everywhere. <laughs> Isn't that right? We're not God, but he wants to see the reflection of his son everywhere in the, in the world. Amen. You know, Paul said that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. For my weakness, his strength is made perfect. Wednesday night, this past Wednesday, I did not feel well at all. I was not feeling good at all. I was sick. And um, I, I just didn't say anything. I just I said, Lord, help me to get through this. And Wednesday night, I started teaching. And when you're sick, you know that it's hard to gather your thoughts but I tried to just put all that aside, how I feel, and focus on the Lord to give me the strength to get through this. Little to my knowledge did I know that many people had texted me and messaged me or even commented on the Wednesday night service of how powerful that message was. And I thought, Lord, how can that be? I, I come at times so prepared, so ready, so prayed up, feeling so good, and I'll preach, and it'll flop. <laughs> Nobody says a word. I had very few viewership, no comments. I thought, Lord, that was a great message. I don't understand. <laughs> and then I come up at times, and I'm thinking, this is going to be a flop. It's horrible. I'm not ready. I'm not prepared, or I'm not feeling well. Or, God, you seem so distant from me. God, please help me. And then... The Lord says, now that you've come to the end of yourself, I can step in and do something. Man, that's what God wants to do with you. I, I'm 57 years old. I'll be 58 soon. <laughs> hint, hint. But <laughs> the young people that are here, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. I I don't, I don't want to discourage you. I don't want to force you. I don't want to make you. I don't want to push you. But I want to lead you. I want to lead you to having a greater encounter with Christ than you ever had. I, 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 want, I, want, you to, I want you to experience his power, his presence, his word that speaks to your heart. I don't want you to resist the Lord, but I want you to encounter the greatness of God. You're the younger church coming up until Jesus comes or tarries. But you're the next generation coming up. I want you to experience his glory. When I first got saved, the glory of God, the Lord, his presence, his nearness, his power would come upon me so many times. I don't want you just to go through the motions. I don't want you to have this distant surface relationship. I want you to know him. Live for him. Through trials, through hardships, through highs, through lows, you hold on to God. You hold on. Let's stand to our feet. That was your short message today. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 There will be seasons of testings. There, there's more to this message I want to deal with. It's, it's very powerful. Very powerful. But church, number one, you might be here today and say, Pastor, I, I feel like this is, you're talking right to me. 
I feel like there just have been seasons I'm going through of testings of hardships. I don't know why. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's your health. I don't know, relational. You're just going through the fire. You need the Lord's help. Maybe this message has spoken to your heart, but I want to pray for you this morning. If you're here today and say, Pastor, I feel like that word is for me today, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All over. I see hands everywhere. I'm just, I'm going through some things. I don't understand. My beloved, it could be that God's bringing you through this for the very purpose of sanctifying you, to purify you, to make you more like Jesus, more like God. But I want you to hold on to the Lord. I want you to have your faith in God. Don't give up. Don't give up. Some of you today, I love you. I appreciate every person in this place. But, but I feel, and you know what I'm talking about. You're just, you're just not giving your all. You're just not surrendered everything to God. You've, you've kind of backed off, if you would. You know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I mean. Maybe you've allowed the cares of this life to get in the way. Maybe you've allowed your heart to grow somewhat cold or indifferent towards the Lord. Maybe it's unbelief that's trying to creep into your heart. You know exactly what I mean. That you're just not giving it all to God and you know it. I love you. I'm not trying to push you or force you. I'm, I'm trying to draw you closer to God. But you know what I mean when I say that you just are kind of holding back. You know who you are. If you'll be so bold and so honest just to raise your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. Pray for me. Pray for me. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on. Come on. This is serious. Thank you. Anybody else? Just kind of holding back. God. Hallelujah. I want to open this altar up to you. I want to give you the opportunity to come to Jesus by faith. And I want you to know that he's with you. I want you to know that he's helping you. I want you to surrender and give it all to God right now. You raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand. I want to call you. Come on to this altar. Come pray with me. Come pray with me. Step out of your pew. Come pray with me. Hallelujah. Come pray. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Come pray with me. Come on. I want more. I want more. Maybe you're going through the fire. I'm going to trust God. I know he loves me. I know he cares about me. I know. I know. Hallelujah. Lord, have mercy. God, help me. God, help me today. Come on. Come on. Come on. To trust what you say. Your 
to encounter God. Hallelujah. That's where I'm at, church. I want to encounter the Lord. And I believe that when we encounter the Lord, is if we'll come to the end of ourselves and like Abraham, we'll pour it all out. Abraham encountered God in his presence and his promise. I want to encounter him. I want to encounter the Lord. Jesus, I want to encounter you. Jesus, I don't want this to be just a mundane, lackadaisical church or congregation, Lord. I want to experience your glory. I want to encounter you, Lord God, in this place. I want to encounter you in my life. I want more. I want more. I desire more. I want the Lord. There's a yearning in my heart for him. I don't know how to express it to the my friends here today, but there's a yearning in my heart. I, I, I just want God. I want Him. I want the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want you to have the same desire. I want this church to have the same desire. Some of us are just going through some tough times. I, sometimes it overwhelms me all the prayers and all the needs and I say God I have no strength I don't have it within myself God you have all power sometimes we try to think that we're God and we think that we have the power or we think that we're the answer but we're not I have to take every need to the one that is the answer and that's Jesus I have to take it to him 
and ask him to touch and to heal and to move and to strengthen and to bless. Asking God to help every person through this fire, through this trial, through this sickness, through this financial crisis. God, you are the one. You are the answer. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm just, I'm just putting myself out here today, folks. I just want God. I just want Him. Praise God. Does anybody else feel that way? You feel that way? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, did you meet me up here then and pray with me then? Can we do that? Would you pray with me together? Can we just come up here together and pray? Lord, hallelujah. Praise God. Have a heart for him, church. Have a heart for him. Have a heart for God right now. Just tell oh God, God, here I am. I pour myself out to you. I empty myself out. Hallelujah. Some of us need a breakthrough. We need an Abraham encounter. 
we need this church we need this encounter with Christ I want you to know I want you to encounter I want you to experience hallelujah the Lord in this place praise God when Jesus is more important to you than anything in this life when God is your everything he is your life he is your breath he is everything he is your life support Christ is all in all hallelujah I pour out I give you my Isaac you understand church I give you my Isaac I give you my all I'm yours Lord hallelujah I give you my future I give you my plans I give you everything hallelujah I want to encounter the Lord your presence God your presence God hallelujah hallelujah the king is among us I want I want my sons and my daughter-in-laws and my daughter I want them to know Christ in such a mighty way I want I want our young people I want to see them have this encounter, life-changing, miraculous, face-to-face, life-changing, powerful encounter with Jesus Christ. Tyra, Trevor, Jeffrey, Abby. I want to see them have this encounter. I, I want to see this church be filled with God, His glory, His presence. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There you are. I was praying. I thought, Hannah. Hannah, what a name. You understand? What a name. I just, I can see God just pouring in even through you. And 
to be a Hannah today. You've got to hold on to God. That will even birth something of God that He does through you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you guys understand what I mean today? I just want Him, His glory. <laughs> Praise God. you more and you know you know how the, the high priest would wear the stones on his chest breastplate of all the tribes of Israel and he would intercede and pray for them but he bore them close to his heart and I feel like that's how I have you I have you right here in my heart amen I don't apologize for going long today. I, I got a busy day, but I don't, I, I want, I want, I, I want him. I want him. Brother Jim, Brother Jim, you got to hold on. Brother Jim, I am so praying for you. I'm so believing for you. I love you, brother. You are precious to me. You and Sister Marcia, crazy. Love you. <laughs> Brother Joe, Sister Helen, you've been through so much. This message, you know, but hasn't God brought you through? And, and hasn't God revealed himself to you in so many ways? Sister Laura Lee? <laughs> You've had some tough days in life, haven't you? Still serving God. See that, this is what speaks to me. This is what speaks to me. This, you know what I'm talking about? When you have been really through hell, in a sense, you have been through the fire, but you keep serving Him. Man, you are my hero. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Jackie, you just, you hold on. I know you hurt. I know you feel abandoned. I know you feel lonely. Sister, we love you. My heart, my heart cries for you. Jesus loves you. You're not alone. Promise you. I know you may feel like it, but you do have a spiritual family that cares. And I know people have abandoned you, forsaken you. But Jesus never will. He never will. Right, Miss April? He never will. Right, Miss Sue? Right. Isn't that right? You've been through it lately. Man, you have been through it. God's faithful. Man, he's faithful. We love you. You see, Jesus knows. <laughs> he's the comforter. Amen. Sister Faith, you've been through some tough times lately. But you, yeah. And and to see and to see the strength of your faith speaks to me. hurting and then she'll call and leave a message on the answer machine encouraging me that's how you're praying for someone they turn around and pray for you they're the one sick <laughs> that's powerful amen tonight's going to be just a little bit different I normally wouldn't do this I normally would not do a wedding on a Sunday 
And I normally would not miss a service for a wedding. But when they said, we want you to preach the gospel, I felt compelled to do this, okay? So um, just pray for me, okay? <laughs> it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll the, is that the Lord saying wrap it up? <laughs> Let's stand together, okay? <laughs> um, praise God. Brother Tom, appreciate you, brother. I, all my brothers, Brother Brian, God bless you. I know you, I know, I know you probably don't like me calling you. It's okay. I, you know, we're, well, we're family now. That's amazing. <laughs> brother Tim, Michael. Leroy, Trevor, Brother Jim, Brother Joe. Who else I got? Where are my brothers here today? Jeffrey, Oscar, where are you, Oscar? There you are, buddy. You're getting you're Oscar. I sure do appreciate you guys. John, God bless you. Hang in there. Matthew, I guess you have to go. You have to go to work. Keep my son in prayer. Keep all my kids in prayer, but the danger of the policemen. Brother Tom, would you dismiss us this, this afternoon, please? <laughs> Amen. Yes. 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 Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Yes. 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 Amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Thank you, Brother Tom. Have a wonderful day today. Please evangelize. Please invite people to church to hear the gospel. God bless you.